Praise the Lord, everyone. Is anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Before I even start prayer, start teaching, yes, the wife is doing good. Yes, the baby's doing fine. No, they're not coming to church today. So, and yes, you will be able to hold them when they come. However, you're going to use sanitizer. You will wash your hands. If you got some strong cologne on, just go ahead and get a bath cloth and wash that off. And then you may partake in holding him. Nobody's going to be offended by that, right? Okay, good. All right. Today we're going to finish our lessons on the benefits of Christian living. And we're going to talk about the Bible. Everybody say the Bible. The Word of God. Is anybody thankful for the Bible that you have today? Let's open up in a word of prayer. Mighty God, we love you today. God, we just thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be in your house, God. Lord, to be able to learn of your word, God, and teach your word. God, we pray that your divine will will be accomplished in this service this morning, God. Lord, we thank you, God, for giving us this word today. Lord, that has the power to change our lives. Lord, that has the power to guide our course today. Lord, just have your way in this service, God. We honor you, and we give your name the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. I almost opened up this service with a song. Order My Steps, the old school choir song. But that song is nowhere in my range. Nowhere. I don't even have range to begin with, but it's nowhere close by. We're going to start off in the book of Luke, chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were going out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. The people were... They were so eager to hear the word that Jesus had for them that they were overcrowding him. So Jesus like, you know what, let me, let me get into this ship to create me a little personal space. Some of y'all probably got some friends that be taking your personal space. So every once in a while you got to take a step back. This is, and that's what Jesus did. Like, let me get on the ship to get some, some space so I can teach everybody. What excites me about this passage of scripture is that the people didn't come at this time seeking miracles or seeking healings. They simply came because they wanted to hear a word from God. Apparently, they knew a value that the word of God can bring. When is the last time that you pressed into his presence just to get a word from him? You didn't go into his presence wanting anything, needing something, but you just wanted to go into his presence just to hear his voice, just to spend time with him. Because everybody in this room already know just one word from the Lord has the power to change every situation in your life. Back to verse 4. Now he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your net for a drop. And Simon answering him said, Master, we have toiled all night. We done worked all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. Everybody say word. I will let down the net. So you're like, look, we done been working all night, but just because you said do it, we're going to let down the net. Verse 6, and when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishers, and the net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so they began to sink. The disciples brought in the biggest catch of their lives by simply being obedient to the word of God. I wonder what God has in the lake of our lives today that he is just waiting for us just to be obedient to his voice, which is his word. The Bible is the most important, powerful book in the world. Does anybody believe that today? 
You're not, I don't care what you like to read, whether it's nonfiction, fiction, a biography. The Bible is the most important and the most powerful book in the world. It's even better than Harry Potter. I don't care how much money she made making Harry Potter. The Bible has more power than that book. Fewer other books have been attacked, misrepresented, and misunderstood, and often quoted out of context as much as the Bible. In your notes, the reason is that the Bible is God's authoritative message of himself to the world. The original manuscripts of the Bible were inspired by God down to the smallest letter. The words of the Bible are the words of God. Because the Bible is God's word, it impacts every aspect of human life. Those who believe find it a rich, fulfilling life here, and they have certainty of a life eternally with Christ. Are there any saints in the house of the Lord today that believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God? It's not just a good book to occupy our time, to make time goes by, but it has the power to speak into our lives. The word provides us with direction. Has anybody ever been in need of direction? And you went and you found your word and you began to study the word and you found the course that you needed to take? That's the power of the word of God. If we want to have that apostolic burden that pastor has been preaching about, then we need to find the love for the word of God. Psalms 119, verses 105. I'm sure we all know this scripture. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. John 5, 39 says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. A man by the name of Everett Harris once said, no one ever graduates from Bible study until he meets the author face to face. Until we meet him, we have to continually have a love and continually study the word of God. Throughout most of the 2,000 years of the church age, the vast majority of Christians did not own a Bible. The availability of the Bible as we know it today resulted from a combination of three developments that also ushered in the modern world. Those are the modernization of paper making and book binding, the invention of the movable type printing press, and then the proliferation of basic literacy. Everybody began to get smarter in the world, began to study. Before the printing press, Bibles had to be hand copied. If I was copying in my hand, y'all would be in trouble. You would have no word today. They were enormously expensive, multi-volume works. Even with the invention of that printing press, the printed Bible was so expensive that only libraries or of universities and very few homes had the Bible, except you had a lot of money, very wealthy people. For nearly 100 years after the Gutenberg produced the first movable type Bible, historians know of only one single copy that resided in somebody's home that was privately owned. Those churches that was fortunate enough to have a portion of the Bible will often lock them away or chain them to the pulpit just to keep them from being stolen. Imagine that was the way today. If you wanted to get a glimpse of the word, you had to drive all the way from your house, come to the pulpit just to get a glimpse of the word of God. The huge demand for a less expensive Bible eventually brought about the formation of the British and Foreign Bible Society in 1804 followed quickly by the American Bible Society in 1816. These societies generated numerous inventions in printing, which drove down the cost and eventually resulted in most families being able to own their own family Bible. Today, in North America, it is not uncommon for a person to own a dozen printed Bibles in addition to the online Bibles that we have today. All right, pop quiz, you got 30 seconds. I want you to discuss with your spouse and your families how many Bibles do you have in your home? How many Bibles do you have? You got one on the kitchen table. You got, you know, one in the bedroom. You got one in the car somewhere. You got the little Bible they gave you as a baby dedicated to the Lord.
let's not go online. Let's go hard copy this time. Because some of y'all got this version, that version. All right, how many of y'all got? Somebody shout some numbers. How many you got? Ten. A dozen. Six. Eleven. Seven. Eight. Okay. So today in this room, your very house, you have more Bibles than the churches had, than a university had back in the day. So we can easily see that the Bible, I think I, I count, I have ten. It's easy. The Bible is easy access to us today. This means that a personal collection of Bibles today can be larger and more diverse than the prestigious universities before the 19th century. The Word of God is available to the average person as never before in history. It seems inconceivable that most of the church history is marked by a lack of direct access to the written Bible. Because God knew this would be the case, he created the Bible so that it would speak to the ears of the hearers as well as to the eyes of the readers. The Bible lets us know that he that hath an ear, let him hear. I hope today that somebody came with a listening ear for the word of God. Because I'm pretty sure that there's many people in this room, when you first came to church, it was the preached word of God that you heard that caused a change to happen in your life. The preacher preached the word, and maybe he was talking about the gift of the Holy Ghost, and you had never heard it before. But as he began to preach the word of God, your ears caught a hold of it, and it began to go down into your soul, into your spirit, and then you responded to the word of God. That's how God intended for his word to be. In fact, there's a great deal of evidence the Bible was meant to be read aloud. Paul instructed the church in Colossians 4, 16, and when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, that ye likewise read the epistles from Laodicea. Jewish worship, especially after the development of the synagogue, always centered on the reading of prescribed or portion of the Old Testament so the entire text could be read out loud throughout a year. This practice was carried on by the church with the addition of the New Testament. Thus, Timothy was instructed in 1 Timothy 4.13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And that's the same thing we should be doing today. We should be taking time to reading and studying the word of God. Because audio Bibles are now available in many formats, Modern Christians can benefit greatly from listening to the Bible while going about their daily tasks. One of the first things I try to do when I get up is go ahead and turn on my Bible app. So the first words that's going into my mind is the word of God. In your notes, of course, hearing the Bible is not sufficient if we do not also apply it to our lives. Everybody say apply it. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. Let's at any time should, should let them slip. So at any time, we don't want to mess up and slip. So we need to read it, and then we need to apply it to our lives. God has called ministers of the word whom he empowers to insist the believers in understanding and applying it correctly to life situations. Those ministers read the Bible aloud so believers hear it. Interpret the Bible so hearers understand its meaning and provide direction so they may correctly apply the word of God to their lives. During the long period when the Bible is not directly available to most believers, some church leaders kind of moved away from this vital work of the ministry. The resulting strict division between clergy and laity hid and distorted the truth of the word rather than pro proclaiming and explaining it. Following the sinful pattern of their society, they became lords over the church rather than servants. But I'm so glad that here at POP, we have a great ministerial staff that is not going to distort the word of God. They don't preach things just to make themselves feel good or just to tickle our ears, but they're going to preach what does say the word of God. And although we can trust our leadership, believers are still responsible for testing the accuracy of what they receive from their leaders and determining for themselves their proper application. God has called pastors and teachers to assist us in this task, but we cannot hand over to our leaders that which is our personal obligation. 
Everybody say this with me. Say, my salvation, my salvation. is my obligation. my obligation. That's how it works. We can't hand it over to anybody else. The word lets us know you have to work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. This is why the Jews of the synagogue in Berea were called the most noble than those in Thessalonica in Acts 17 and 11. Both groups received the message of Paul and Silas and were persuaded of the truth. But these, these folks at this church, they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so in Acts 17 and 11. When you hear the word of God come forth from the pulpit, you have a responsibility to make sure that it adds up to the scriptures. That's our personal responsibility. Again, this church has been blessed with men of God that we can trust to give us the unadulterated word of God. They're going to give us the word, and it's not going to be tainted whatsoever. If they preach something that you feel doesn't add up to the word of God, I'm sure they won't mind you coming to them so they can explain to you their viewpoint from the word of God. As a matter of fact, they're probably excited about the fact that you're listening and that you're taking a personal interest and in getting clarity from the word of the Lord. In God's kingdom, nobility does not come from unquestioning trust in our leaders, but from constant examination of our own ideas to those of our leaders against the yardstick of the word of God. Living our lives in the word requires that the word becomes alive in us through daily reading of, listening to, and studying the Bible. The more we read it, the more expectancy we will have to see the pages of the word of, of God come, come to life in our own lives. The more we read about unity in the Bible, the more we're going to want to see unity take place in POP. The more we read about the miracles and wonders and signs in the word of God, the more we're going to come to church with the expectancy. God, if you did it back in those days, and I believe it, you're going to do it again on October 1st, 2017. We must fight the tendency to vest the church in the pulpit rather than the pew. We all worship together, we study together, we learn together, and we grow together. Church leaders are uniquely equipped to serve the congregation by their callings, their spiritual gifts, their biblical education, and dedication to prayer and study. But their ultimate purpose is to equip the saints, you and I, to do the work of the ministry. And you find that in Ephesians 4 and 12. Good leaders infuse every believer with enthusiasm for hearing, reading, and studying, and living the Bible in their lives. In your notes, ideally, the Bible should become so much a part of us that our decisions, our imaginations, and desires are guided by a thought process permeated with the word what does the word of God say about this situation if I do this if I say that how does that add up to the word of God if it adds up right then go ahead and do it but if there's something wrong and it's not adding up the way it needs to then you need to filter your decision by the word of God just as the Bible does not belong only to a, a professional class of clergy so the proclamation of this message is not restricted to the elders of the church. Every member of the body of Christ is commanded to teach and admonish one another through speech and through spiritual song. So even me, through a spiritual song, I might be able to admonish one brother, maybe, or one sister. We are called to be witnesses to the world by our acts of love, our lifestyle of holiness, and with wise speech. In our increasing secularized society, Everybody is distrusting everybody. It's kind of hard to find trust. It's kind of hard to find somebody who actually takes the Bible seriously. It's kind of easy at times to maybe to involve in like conflict with them, but we just have to let the love of God just show through our lives. While fears of social, legal, and even physical retribution may not be wholly unfound, and this is in your notes, the church has always had its greatest growth when confronted by hostile society. It seems like when there's conflict, that's when the church begins to grow. One might think that the legal persecution of Paul would have resulted in a chilling effect on the spread of the gospel. But it was quite the opposite. In Philippians 1 and 14, and many other brothers in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, 
are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul was like, there's some brothers, when they saw how, how bound up I was and they saw what I was going through, that just encouraged them. That fired them up to speak the word of God more boldly without any fear. Unless the word of Christ dwells in us richly, we may be lured into resentful debates and tempted to attack people rather than defend the gospel. The word, the more the word becomes a part of us, the less we will feel drawn by such divisive practices. Thus, meditating on the word of God, bringing together our hearing, heeding to the word, and speaking to the Bible molds us and helps us to get in alignment with the spirit of the author of the Bible. We all know Psalms 1 and 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law that he meditate day and night. I mean, he's, he's always in the word. What does the word of God have for me today? We are to be examined and focus ourselves on the word of God and making it a vital part of our thought process. Meditation takes what we know and makes it that by which we reason. And as such, our thinking becomes clearer through the lens of the word of God. Peter warns us that the scriptures are often hard to understand and can be twisted destructively by those who are ignorant or unlearned, undisciplined, and unstable. The Bible can be destructive to those who focus on words, phrases, or verses without interpreting them in the contents of their passage or their book or overall purpose of the word of God. Similarly, excessive use of proof texting or finding a verse regardless of its context to prove a point distorts the meaning of the Bible and robs it of the power that it means to have. In your notes, those willing to become disciples of the Bible by spending the time and effort necessary to be instructed in its meaning, finding it rich benefits. If we study the word of God, we're going to find some benefits in the word of God. Through it, God leads us in the path of righteousness. Without his guidance, we are in constant danger of slipping. But by it, we learn the way we should go, and we are guided by God's own eye. Although the Bible provides instruction in true worship, it's just not a sacred handbook. Although it teaches us how to manifest true religion, it's not intended just to make us religious. Rather, it is the core value of every Christian entire lifestyle. It's to be the way we operate, the Bible should be the, at the core of that, how we respond. The Bible is the most powerful book in the world because it reveals the mind of the Almighty. If you want to know what God is thinking, get into your word. If you want to know the plan that he has for you and your family, get into his word. As such, it demands extra respect and careful treatment. That is not to say the Bible is an enchanted book of mystical knowledge. The Bible does not provide us with a set of sacred mantras to which we impose our will upon the universe. As a book, a Bible is a little different from any other liter literary work, but its contents are the word of God. It words conveys the very thoughts of God and express his self-revelation to mankind. Now, the power of the Bible does not come by quoting it, but by obeying it. God desires to use the power of his revelation to bring people to him and to instruct the believers in unchanging truth. As harmful as the misuse of the Bible can be, it can be a thousand times more beneficial when used correctly. In your notes, God used the authoritative message of the Bible to edify. Has anybody ever been edified by the word of God? To bring healing, purify, reprove, rebuke, correct, and instruct. Those who follow his word find nourishment for the soul. Has anybody found nourishment for your soul? His power is not in the paper, binding, or ink, or even the letters, words, or sentence, but it is the spirit of God which inspires it. We may use it as a set of tools, but we must be changed by it as an expression of God himself. 2 Timothy 3, chapter verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou have learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom they have learned them, and that from a child thou have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 
All scripture. Everybody say all scripture. Even those scriptures you might not even like. All scriptures is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I might have to skip a little bit here. The, fact that science has, the facts of science have changed as humans have become more aware of the universe around them and developed better tools for scientific examination. The facts of history has changed. As previously unknown evidence has surfaced, and historical tools and technology has been refined. The facts of daily living has changed as societies shift and mold themselves to new technology and ideas. That iPhone didn't exist years ago, but now most of us, we got an iPhone, we got a computer, we got a laptop. So technology is always changing. Even people are constantly changing. Your best friend is always changing. Your spouse is always changing. I'm not going there today. Even people are constantly changing as a result of progress, education. You know, somebody, they got their degree, and once they got their degree, there was a whole other person after that. And experience. If you go through a, an experience in life, whether it's good or bad, that experience is going to change you. Labor and delivery change me. <laughs> it changed me the first time. It changed me the second time. And it changed me again the third time. It, it'll change you. If the Bible had been made up of thoughts of human beings, it would have been outdated. It would have been, you know, contradicting itself a few centuries after Moses began to pen it. But instead, it is the work of the unchanging God who knows all from the beginning. Correctly interpreting it depends upon knowing something about the culture, the history, and the language of the people who formed its initial audience. But God used that changing canvas to present an unchanging revelation. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all even all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If you're here today and you're like, man, I'm not growing. I need to grow some more. Get into the word. In closing, people of the last two centuries have more fort are more fortunate than any time before because of the inexpensive copies of the Bible being translated in their native tongue and is readily available. As you already seen today, some of y'all got five, six, eight, ten copies of it. Surely the reforms and revivals leading to the modern apostolic movement became possible as a direct result of this abundance of Bibles in the hand of ordinary men and women. By the instruction of the Spirit, the eyes of our spiritual forefathers were opened to biblical truths from the masses of Christians, although plainly stated in Scripture. Those, through the work of the call ministry, through discussion with fellow believers, and listening to the leading of the Spirit, we continue to open ourselves to God's use of the Bible to instruct, enlighten, and lead us. The Bible is not just a monologue. It does not need to be only God speaking to us as we read or as we listen. In your notes, instead, the spirit-filled believer interacts with the Bible by taking advantage of a personal relationship. Everybody say relationship. A personal relationship with this divine author. Matthew Henry wrote, the Bible is a letter God has sent to us, and prayer is a letter we send to him. Through prayer and meditation on the word, Bible study becomes an open dialogue with God that frequently becomes a friendly chat between a heavenly father and his beloved son. Our 28th president, Mr. Woodrow Wilson, once said, I am sorry for men who do not read the Bible every day. I wonder why they would deprive themselves of the strength and pleasure. So my, my caution for you today is don't deprive yourself of the strength and pleasure that you will find 
in the word of God. Thank God for his written word. Let's all stand and pray today. Mighty God, we love you today. Father, Lord, we are truly thankful, God, for giving us, God, your word that, that leads us, that guides us, Lord, that gives us direction, Lord, and that gives us hope, God, of eternal life with you. God, we just thank you for allowing us to be here today. God, we ask you to bless our refreshments, and God, bless the remainder of this service. Whatever your will is, God, we're open up to receive your will today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.